Hello and welcome back to Talking Insights, the podcast series from SMO. I'm your host, Shrika Govindaraju, and throughout this series, we're taking a closer look at the key topics of today, taking a step beyond the world of research and insights to tackle the big issues of our time. Our sector deals with understanding and predicting the world that we live in. So let's look beyond the numbers and dive into the most important conversations of today that will shape our tomorrow. The healthcare sector is in the middle of a massive shakeup. As the COVID pandemic unfolds, attitudes towards personal health and well-being, as well as how and when to see medical professionals, are changing across the globe. While some countries embrace the possibilities that new technology offers, others seem reluctant to move on from traditional way of getting healthcare advice, and we all seem to be paying more attention to our health. Now, new research conducted by Borderless Access has revealed exactly how attitudes towards healthcare are changing across the globe, from the USA to South Africa, Nigeria to Indonesia. What do people see as the future of healthcare? How do attitudes vary between developed and developing nations? What will the impact be on those choosing to travel during the pandemic? And how will healthcare evolve as we move into the future? Now, I'm delighted today to be joined by not just one, but three from the team at Borderless Access. Uh, So we have Max Schickel, Vice President of Borderless Access in Europe. So Max is a seasoned market research professional with over 13 years of market research experience and is active as a thought leader in the healthcare panel industry. Before his time at Borderless Access, he was Director of Healthcare at Dynata, where he was instrumental in building ResearchNow's healthcare business. In 2014, he established ResearchNow's healthcare business unit in Germany, and he expanded his responsibility to the EMEA level. We're also joined by Mahesh Lingaya, who is Associate Vice President of Healthcare Services. Now, Mahesh is a multifaceted healthcare industry expert with over 18 years of experience across markets, such as the US, the EU, Japan, Africa, and South Asia. His expertise is across pharmaceutical manufacturing, KPO, research, analytics, and BPM business models. As a solutions architect, he's designed transformational solutions for some pharmaceutical, medical devices, payer, and provider clients. And last but not least, we're also joined by Siam Jain, Associate Director of Research Act Services. So during his 11 years in the research industry, Siam has worked across a range of industries and studies and brings an expertise of traditional as well as digital market research with past experience at Kantar and also in his current role at Borderless Access. Uh, Within the Borderless Access team, Siam develops digital insights capabilities with innovative Qualquant research methodologies and uses them to generate practical and actionable insights for their clients. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. (laughs) So let's uh, jump right in, because this is some really interesting research, especially in light of the the current situation around the world. Now, based on the research and the, sur- the, the survey that you carried out, do you think we're seeing a more permanent move towards virtual or remote doctor consultations? Or is this something that is more reactionary to the COVID pandemic? So my answer to that from whatever findings we have done, it's more reactive uh, than a permanent one because we, we interacted with various physicians who are with multiple practice types. Like example, someone who's a dentist, someone who's an orthopedic, uh, someone who's a GI specialist. So when we look at their practice patterns, so they've got some initial critical treatments where a physical examination becomes mandatory. So there's, there's a mixed feeling now. So it's like, uh, so it's not going to be a permanent solution, but something like post treatment, after the observation is done, prescriptions are given observations are going on so then it works well whereas regular day-to-day medications flu viral infections allergies cold cough there it's working well in terms of telemedicine where it's interactions quick on a handheld device or desktop computer so that's where we can see it's like it's it's proactive at certain specialties on a day-to-day mm-hmm. whereas would go with a little bit of specialty practice uh, there there is a certain percentage of face-to-face for sure, and then slowly translates depending upon the risks of that patient trying to reach to the physician uh, clinics or hospitals. So that was the observation what we saw. It's across markets. It's it's mm-hmm. just not to one uh, region, either Europe or India or APAC. It's the same. So that's where I was just quoting one example, uh, which will which will be a right one like. A dentist or a patient who's like has got an aggregating tooth pain uh, cannot do it medicine at all. He's got to just yeah hospital clinic. So that's just one example. So that's that's thought I I thought I'll bring it up. So just to tell like to summarize um, what I feel or what we observed 
medis medications which are on a day to day treatment or something like uh, pediatric patients very sensitive so in those segments uh, telemedicine or the digitized uh, interaction with the physicians are working good whereas critical ailments something which needs immediate attention uh, it's still uh, face to face true i think uh, what what has happened is that telemedicine uh, as an industry was growing uh, but the pace of the growth was not that fast right uh, with pandemic definitely it has acted as a catalyst for telemedicines right uh, people mm-hmm. have uh, started uh, engaging with the doctors as mahesh said for the general checkup right for something which is not critical uh, people started uh, consulting uh, using telemedicine because uh, definitely it is much more uh, safer uh, during the times of pandemic and and hence it helps uh, so yes pandemic kind of helped in uh, putting or pushing the uh, pushing across the telemedicine uh, there'll be growth uh, as we see uh, right people are kind of they've kind of tasted the telemedicine uh, they feel that yes uh, it is something which is uh, doable uh, mm-hmm. right uh, but the growth uh, would be Uh, would be faster but not uh, something which was there or which is currently there right and are you seeing you know the services that were there before are we just seeing an evolution of the same tools that were available or are we seeing new tools that are now emerging you know the phrase that came to mind when you were giving me that answer then was necessity is the mother of invention so you know given that we're in this situation people are turning more to these methods are we seeing new tools that are emerging or is this just an advancement or more of a pick up of things that were there before the covid situation hit new tools are emerging for sure uh, mostly towards ease of patients in terms of booking appointments scheduling meetings or even in terms of book, booking up uh, um, drugs at the pharmacy so that that's evolving a lot of complicated apps which were there earlier has become very user friendly when we look at various physician demo, uh, various various patient demographics um a people between age group at 25 going till 35 40 uh, pretty much good on the digitized ones whereas uh, the the elderly ones struggle with that so they mm-hmm. they're trying to tweak their apps and make it user friendly now uh, so that features are getting uh, interesting so they have a quick to reach doctors and a lot of other things interesting to know it's it's evolving for sure and getting lot more easier uh, for interactions yeah so it is uh, what's happening is uh, yes uh, as mahesh mentioned the existing tools have kind of played a good role also so people are now utilizing them much more uh, than they were before and there is whole lot of innovation which has happened uh, innovation has happened in terms of making those uh, tools or solutions much more user friendly uh making people aware and also kind of taking them to uh, to the uh, wider audience right people are small private uh, clinics uh, they are trying to reach out to smaller uh, cities as well with their own solutions uh with the quick uh, smaller kits for testing right digital kits so there is whole lot of innovation which is happening uh and uh, it is fueled by both uh, existing as well as uh, new just one more thing to add see i don't have the numbers but i know installation of uh, physician interaction apps are increasing uh download of those uh, uh widgets or apps are increasing uh, i don't have those numbers but i know it's it's happening uh, because that's that's becoming mostly a mandate now and also the e pharmacies are going into play now so a lot of things around that so that we can they can get a home delivery on the medication stuff for all markets so that's what we see like there is uh, interesting stuff coming on the technology side yeah. and do you see there's room for you know these kind of technical solutions at every stage of the uh, you know of the healthcare process so you you mentioned before about you know consultation in certain instances and then you have your prescriptions and then you know post kind of um let's say if you have a surgery the kind of follow ups after that is there at every step of this process is there room for a new technical innovation or a disruptive kind of tool to come into play not like a disruptive one so it's like 
they're enhancing their app current applications so that they can see uh, it's it's both ways so mm-hmm. the developer market so there is a uh, there is still a benefit of doubt about how secure is that patient data so can uh, so that becomes a critical thing and most of the solutions are still struggling with that so it's it's just a uh, very high level uh, patient details which is available on the apps so the more complex they want to make it serve for every phase of the treatment uh, mm-hmm. from examination going till uh, um, other diagnostics and treatment kind of cycles uh, which means like patients are sharing more data and the security becomes a question so a lot of the companies will have will have to think on that and that's where it would take some time as what is my feeling it it won't be so quick because solving that whole uh, security aspect of both developer and developing countries um, is still a challenge so that's why i was mentioning in starting like it's easier and quicker uh, for day to day medications rather than trying to do something like an oncology post surgery mm-hmm. those those ones are really tough yeah because you have a lot of drug information you have uh, information of diagnostics uh, some information even probably on the radiology side so that that cannot go on an app so so that's that that's what we feel after we mm-hmm. do all of this uh, research and what we come up with yeah so well, I was speaking of patients there so obviously most of the people that are listening uh, to this podcast you know within the research sector are unlikely to be doctors uh, so we're more likely to be patients in this scenario now, you know what are some of the advantages and disadvantages for patients when we move to these remote uh, tools when you when you move to consulting with doctors remotely you know what are the benefits for patients and are there some drawbacks to this as well and i think the most important question that most people will have is do you believe you can receive the same level of care or the same quality of care when you're using these remote tools that that benefit of doubt is there for sure the, the what we have seen is like the there's no 100% confirmation that it will be as effective as a face to face that's because the time is limited whatever whatever time they try get to spend on that telemedicine is like time bound 20 minutes or 30 minutes whatever they get or probably 15 minutes it has to be very direct conversation and at times uh, people are uh, they miss out a lot of things which they probably would have, would have told while they are in front of a doctor uh, looking at the body language and they get more confidence so that's the drawback what i see whereas advantages uh, knowing that the numbers of covid is spiking every country um getting out becomes very difficult uh, and also the traffic of patients in a hospital is cannot be managed so that's an advantage of having this telemedicine so just one example to quote um, was talking to a friend of mine just curious about how people in us are trying to get in get into the uh, physicians clinic so that's an interesting thing what i learned is like we know that uh, the parking lot has become a Uh, waiting area now so right, okay. the board comes out <laughs> the yeah. board it comes out as part of the token and that's the time when the patient gets out of his car and gets to see the physician yeah. <laughs> so, so that's something which i learned during this kind of a research so so that's what i would say like in terms of effectiveness um, mm-hmm. it's not complete but it saves time for sure and in in instead of Uh, if we talk about pediatric patients where normally patient uh, the parents get panicked uh, when the kids are either ill or they cough or this yes yeah. it serves well for that purposes so in or in someone like we have a continuous fever so those kind of quick things it's decently effective i can't say like mm-hmm. very effective but still the physician would stress like do come and visit whenever you you get a chance to so that they can examine the person more detailedly mm-hmm. yeah true what happens as mayesh mentioned is that uh, yes there's definite advantage in terms of the whole comfort convenience right people kind of uh, being able to get consultation uh, within their daily work right uh, mm-hmm. on top of that what telemedicine uh, additionally gives us uh, with the whole evolution of digital era across uh, demographics right across segments is that it helps in uh, uh, 
reaching out to underserved people with quality care right that's uh, also one of the key things yes as mahesh mentioned that it is not a direct uh, replacement of this versus that there are certain advantages and uh, definitely there are certain disadvantages in terms of uh, yes there are some privacy issues as well as uh, the kind of uh, in terms of critical illnesses people would uh, rather prefer uh, much more uh, face to face interaction so that the complete diagnosis can happen uh, in a much more realistic fashion yeah data protection is is a huge issue here mm-hmm. it's a huge thing especially in europe especially in germany so people are very cautious about sharing their private data with uh, um a, pr- a practice or with other people in general so um um yes people have been using uh, telemedicine very frequently across the globe also in germany for example but still they are very concerned about who's dealing with my data what's happening with my data where is it stored who has access to it so i think this is something that needs to be improved moving forward and it's very different from country to country you know? mm-hmm. in some countries we don't have we, we didn't observe much of data protection issues or concerns at all in other markets there are a lot like in germany now it's interesting you mentioned it was one of my thoughts um you know obviously in, in europe we've had the gdpr for a couple of years and i think it's very much in the public conscious and you know health data in particular is in a special category and i was wondering you know obviously max that's with your experience in germany and you know india has also recently brought into effect uh, you know data protection law so mahesh and simon wondering you know from a boots on the ground perspective in india are you seeing a similar level of concern like max mentioned then from people in terms of where is the data going to who has a hold of it who has access to it is that also a public concern for those using these services yes but, but very highly leaning towards critical illnesses okay something like where there is an annual treatment going on or where there's a two year or three year cycle treatment so that is a concern so most of the people would not like to share those kind of uh, information mm. and so, i also want to touch back on um, sorry speaking of differences between uh, looking at europe and uh, Yeah, another country as well uh, as so i mentioned then one of the advantages of course for patients using these tools is if you live in a you know an underserved community or if you're in i guess one of the things that in if you're geographically let's say far away uh, from a doctor as well is that another driving factor do you think behind the difference in opinion that we see between certain countries or developing countries and you know europe and, and looking at the us as well the answer is yes so there is there is differences for sure uh because it's it's that lifestyle of that patient so when we interacted we interacted with 3000 plus patients across 10 markets and that's how the thing has come out by the demographics what we were playing according to the social economic kind of uh, the factors okay so it varies so there are countries who are like uh quite open who fall on the high end of the quadrant whereas there are, there are countries who are who are not so open there are countries who are totally close that we, we don't want to share the data so it's it's a mixed bag so out of this 10 markets we can see all flavors of acceptance and not acceptance uh, yeah. the data. <laughs> i think what uh, it uh, yes it uh, helps in uh, reaching out to the masses and uh, that's what uh, if we see by markets also right uh, developing markets are kind of showing uh, more traction towards tele medicines right uh, and there are few additional aspects also right there is higher population density so people are a bit cautious in terms of trying to get uh, exposed when they step out uh, secondly yes the existing healthcare uh, infra right uh, the infra is uh, not that strong when compared to developed markets and hence uh, telemedicine kind of plays a strong role there also and on top of that uh, as we saw that uh, markets like india nigeria right uh, there has been whole lot of uh, innovation focus around uh, digital as well as the push is coming from uh, small as well as uh, big private players also so most of them are pushing themselves whereas what happens in uh, developed markets is it's the healthcare uh, infra is already so much structured right uh, whereas in uh, undeveloped market or growing markets growing economies there are so many players that everyone is trying to gain that share right 
Mm-hmm. There's, the push is uh, much more stronger. And do you think there's a difference then as well between countries where you know healthcare is more privately run or it's run by you know, insurance players or private hospitals, private doctors, as opposed to you know in Europe and a lot of countries where you have socialized medicine, you have government provided healthcare as well. Are we also seeing a difference there in terms of how people are likely to? Like I just think what Max mentioned in terms of you know in Germany, people not being so willing to to trust handing over their information. Is some of that perhaps tied to, you know, is this going to a public body, a government body, or is this going to a private business who, you know, made in turn profit off the information that you do pass on to them? Yeah, that, that's right. See, because it's uh, when, when, when the information passes on, you've got both sides. You've got the diagnostic uh, areas of information. You've got the treatment side of the information. So it's very difficult for a patient to sign up for that. Uh, because when they sign up, it, it's it's now a lot of confidential information, the types of products they have used or the types of tests they have gone through. Uh, it just opens up. So hmm. that's where uh, in the develop, developed world, either the North America or the Euro, it's a very serious no-no when it comes to that kind of a disclosure of data. Uh, in the developing world, uh, there is... There is a little bit of S. I can't tell a hundred percent S. Uh, for medications, there is still it's like progressing. Whereas the developed world, they know like it's a mandate, and with like the way you explained about the GDPR, and that's that's mm-hmm. a very strong compliance. So cutting that becomes very tough. So that's that's how it is. Like serious no no versus slightly moving towards a comfort zone because the patients in the developing world that waiting time for a physician or the traffic is very high. So rather than spending time on that waiting period, so it's good to be on a virtual uh, Mm pre-booked slot where it becomes easier and faster with the physician interaction. Uh, Max, what's what's your take on this? Um, I just uh, wanted to add that um, both private companies as well as the governmental bodies are sort of competing Mm -hmm. on um, on on the data. So and I think that that's also um, um, adding to to the concern here that that the patients don't really know where the data is going to. So especially if it's a private company dealing with your data, there's always the risk that they, it, it will be used for any commercial uh, aspects, and, and that's something no one really wants. Um, and as long there's this um, unclarity around this, I think the, these concerns will remain. Mm-hmm. So perhaps, you know, more transparency might be the key here to to getting more people to sign up, you know, especially as you mentioned, if you take Germany again as a case example, would people perhaps be more likely to use these tools if there was a clear, transparent document absolutely. that they could look at? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think transparency is very is key here. Yeah, for everyone. So, um, yeah, the answer is yes. Now, moving on from from patients, let's look at the the other side of the equation, who are, you know, of course, the doctors, physicians themselves. I understand you've also carried out a similar study speaking to speaking to the caregivers. Um, so, have you have you noticed any differences or similarities in the attitudes from the doctor's point of view, uh, as opposed to the patients within these same markets? Similarities are there, which is about adapting towards telemedicine or uh, uh, digitized interaction with the patient. So, answer is yes. So when we did it, we can call it like there's a 50 per, 50 50 percent uh, is no for the patient for adaptation. Similarly with the physician. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, something which we observed, apart from the willingness to adapt, the doctors were willing to adapt. It's just they, it's the time for them to uh, learn the process in terms of how do they manage or how do they monitor the patient. It's something which takes a little bit of longer time for them, but there is openness for adapting towards uh, telemedicine and digitization because now uh, that's that's like it's leaning towards you'll have to get get to the uh, virtual uh, meeting uh, either way so that's that's how was what we saw it's getting slowly uh, mm-hmm. but high willingness uh, because because even even the even at the hospitals it's becoming challenging to manage patients during these times and are we seeing is it it's echoed again in terms of where the doctors are based. So, you know, we discussed previously how patients in, in let's say, developed versus developing economies 
have different views to this. Are we seeing a similar attitude from the doctors who are in developed versus developing countries as well? It's it's similar. Uh, the only difference is coming around the practice, either it's a clinical practice or a hospital practice kind of thing. Uh, the clinical practice, people are not so open towards telemedicine because they want to have a closer look of the patient. Hospitals, their adaptation is quick because they have the ready technology to do the whole transformation uh, towards telemedicines or the digitized uh, uh, examination of the patients. So that's the slight difference where it plays a role from a developed to the mm. developing part of the world. And do we think then looking forward, to, you know, when I was briefly speaking to you guys before we started recording, I mentioned you know, my, my dad's in the NHS. He's, you know, getting towards the point of retirement now. But let's say the next generation of doctors, are they going to have to learn to use and deal with these new tools going forward as part of their day-to-day -day jobs? Do you see it becoming more integral to not just their role, but it's also as part of the training as well? Yes, it is. So the whole uh, challenges around how the upcoming doctors can adapt to this new technology, uh, because that's becoming a mandate about how much of uh, patient engagement they can do over a remote monitoring or a remote setting is something which they'll have to quickly learn because it's it's becoming a need of an hour now. So mm. otherwise, it's it's tough to interact with patients. And I think they've already started parts of the way I, when we started seeing the uh, results of our uh, research, so we could see that there is... Uh, quick adapt, adaption towards uh, remote monitoring, patient engagement, uh, going faster at both sides, developed market and developing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. What happens is the push is coming from uh, uh, three sides, I would say, right? Uh, first is patients, they themselves are kind of interested and willing to go ahead with the telemedicine, right? Uh, second is hospitals and clinics. Uh, that also gives them a bigger leeway in terms of reaching out to wider audience, wider coverage. And third is the whole uh, tech, uh, the healthcare uh, front is driven by so many tech companies as well as uh, companies like uh, Philips, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And others. Uh, so everyone is pushing towards technology. Uh, so the push is coming from those three sides and definitely it will happen that uh, new generation, as you know, that is anyways tech savvy. Yeah. So the, the it is more likely that uh, it will further strengthen. Yeah. I think speaking of you know generations and being more tech savvy, you know, one of the things I, I picked out from the research I looked at is these the generational differences uh, in terms of the attitude towards these remote uh, doctor consultations. I mean, do you think, based on the research, are younger generations, you know, regardless of country, are they more likely to to adopt these new methods? Are they more likely to embrace the technology? Instead of, you know, I have friends here who are almost, they're too scared to pick up the phone and call a doctor because they think it's a, it's a strange thing. So are we seeing that, you know, younger generations, are they going to take this on more? And obviously that's going to, you know, shape into the future as well. Answer is yes. So if we see the research the results, age group between 20, uh, 20, 25, going till 40, 45 are the ones who are the quick, quick adapt, uh, adapting patients for the uh, technology so that's that's what we were able to observe when uh, when we were doing the research uh, compared to the elderly or to the uh, teenage population groups true so what happens is uh, and that kind of reflects in both uh, current consultation behavior as well as uh, what are the likelihood or what they themselves see would be their future consultation also right so as I said if we talk about what is happening right now so almost 50% uh, of the people uh, who are uh, younger generation during this particular period, right, uh, during COVID, did a consultation. And uh, what we saw is their experience was good. And uh, most of the people have shown interest of uh, uh, doing or using e e telemedicine again uh, when compared mm -hmm. to older generation. And that holds true when we talk about uh, their future consultation also. So almost like uh, more than 90% of the uh, younger audience uh, who consulted, uh, e teleconsulted in past, they said that, yes, they are pretty open and they will use that in future as well. And I guess on the, the, the flip side of this is when we speak about, you know, older patients, is, is the reason behind them being less likely to use this, is it just the technological 
barrier, uh, you know, you might say, if they're not as tech savvy, or is it also because maybe they're just more used to doing this in person, you know, for a longer time, they've been used to going in person. So it's some, it's a kind of comfort that you want to, to stick with. Yeah, it's a kind of yes and no answer. So if we look at the comfort zone, uh, the the age group, what, whatever we've mentioned between 20 and 40, they, they're, they're comfortable. Uh, whereas it's not the same for the elderly because they're, they have multiple complications. What I mean by that is uh, they're either diabetic or they're, they're either high cholesterol or they're, uh, they are an orthopedic patient. So it's multiple complexity which, which makes them uh, comfortable by being in front of a physician rather than uh, doing it uh, on a uh, electronic media. So that that's the thing. So what what I felt while we saw the results. Yeah. Now, I think and one of the other differences, you know, that, that we picked up on uh, in the research as well, and we mentioned it a few times now, uh, is the difference between your respondents who are based in developing countries, so in a place such as India, Nigeria, uh, versus those based in countries such as the USA or Germany. And there, I, there's a pretty stark kind of difference in the, um, the attitudes towards using these new techno technologies there. Uh, so why do you think, you know, based on statistics or maybe based on other research that you've done, why are respondents in the developing countries seemingly much more open to move towards the digital future compared to those who are based in in the developed countries in the Western economies? So in terms of the willingness or the adaption in the developing countries moving closer to the technology is like it's... Uh, what, the way we we were trying to assess it, or the way we were trying to see it, is it it was it was like slightly faster than developed developed markets. So that's because there's the same thing. A lot of push coming from the Ministry of Health for that particular country, or a lot of private firms trying to be proactively providing those services uh, at a lower cost, or probably at almost a uh, kind of a complementary or a sponsorship kind of a thing. So that adaption is kicking off closer towards the developed markets because they're in a place where, where they're trying to enroll patients on their applications. Uh, that's where the, that race towards getting on to the virtual interaction is getting higher on the developed markets, developing markets, sorry. Whereas the ones on the developed markets, there's not much of around disturbance or concern around enrolling more patients because you can see the same patients who are already there or an, on an insurer or a or a payer plan or a provider plan, they're already there, uh, which is not which is not the case for the developing market. So there's a lot of push coming from the top down side from the ministry and private organizations to get more patients enrolled or onboarded on, on the digital stuff. So that's that's what uh, we would try to observe. Yeah, and I think uh, there were some. Uh data protection policies as well uh, and uh, some uh, policies across some of the markets around telemedicine consultation right uh, in developed markets which were there which were lifted uh, just after pandemic uh, so that uh, people can kind of uh, go ahead with their telemedicine but those kind of restrictions were uh, not uh, major in the developed markets in the growing markets right so that's uh, one thing and additionally uh, initially, in some of the markets, uh, insurance coverage, right? That also is one of the key factors. Was not part of telemedicine, whereas it will, it is now gradually kind of getting covered. So, and what happens in developed markets is that most of the people are uh, insured, right? Whereas mm -hmm. in developing markets, uh, the consultation fee goes out of their pockets, right? Yeah. So for them, uh, it is uh, business as usual, uh, shifting from in-person to telemedicine because in both the scenarios, they will have to pay. Whereas uh, in the developed markets, it goes out of uh, insurance versus their pockets, right? So that also is uh, one of the factors. Mm -hmm. And on the note, there's a, in the article that, that Max put together for Research World, there's a, there's a really interesting diagram, which was you know, the future online versus in-person consultation broken down by market. And funnily enough, India and Germany sit at exactly opposite sides uh, of the diagram. So, you know, you have in Germany, they want more in-person, less digital, less likely to use digital. And then on the opposite end, you have India who want, you know, more digital and, and less in-person. Uh, so I, I guess, Max, you know, from a boots on the ground perspective uh, in Germany, I mean, is this 
what do, what do you think is kind of driving this difference uh, in opinion? Why is it that Germany, you know, in particular, is a bit of an outlier? Why why is Germany so reluctant to move forward uh, down this digital path? <laughs> um, <laughs> good question. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you said that all the people are more used to using the traditional way of consulting, and that's that's, that's something that that really um, is happening in Germany. People are so used to 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 the service level that they get from from a physician when they visit him or her in in her practice and it's working very well here in germany so people don't they are reluctant to to change and to are not as open as other people in other countries to to technology so um why should i pick up my phone and call my doctor if i can just walk across the street <laughs> and yeah. see him in person even if i'm i'm sick there's no no point in doing so that's that's the mindset and in countries like india it's so vast so you have to travel sometimes for hours or days to see a doctor and then you rather pick up the phone and say hey or your um, smartphone with, with camera and then try to get hold of your physician and, and that's simply totally different here in germany so i think that's definitely one reason just, just to add on to what max was saying it's basically about the round trips So in India, we just want to avoid too many round trips <laughs> going on with the physician again and again, week after week. So yeah, <laughs> we want digital rather than many visits. You sort of kind of want one discussion and then it's done, and that's yeah. you can move on with you. <laughs> <laughs> But it's cute because because Max mentioned that a kind of cultural thing. One of the things I've noticed, you know, when I visited India as well over the past, you know, ten twenty years now, is how quickly technology that really just exploded onto the scene it was almost as if you know i went there one summer and people were still on you know the kind of old nokia brick phones and you know there's barely any internet coverage and then you go back a few years later and suddenly everyone's got a smartphone in their hands everyone's on 4g everyone's using food delivery apps and you know whatever else is is do you think this is also tied into that kind of wider cultural move towards embracing technology especially in a you know country such as india where technology is really been integrated into day-to-day -day life at a really rapid pace uh, over, over the past few years. That's right. Yeah, there, there is that whole paradigm shift which is happening now in the healthcare where the adapt, uh, adaption of these technologies is, is at a very faster pace when compared to the past two, three years or five years back. That's because it's become an, it's like almost getting, it's no, no more in need of an hour. It's become like, You have to get on that to either save time or be safe at home, rather than going and um, getting to a risk zone. So that's where I see like it's it's more getting closer towards the technology, uh, hmm. and that the transformation is faster and at a higher pace uh, when compared to the earlier uh, periods. True, I think uh, what has happened is uh, the complete access to cheaper smartphones. Right mm -hmm. or affordable smartphones and data. Right, if you compare the internet uh, data prices in India versus some of the developing or other developed markets, they are they are fairly cheap. It's yeah. like uh, almost free, you can say. Right. So those are the uh, that's uh, that has pushed uh, the complete digital industry uh, in India with the, everyone kind of accessing. Uh, online, always online, uh, accessing the food delivery apps, uh, OTTs, right? So the complete mm -hmm. push has come because of this digital uh, access, as well as a lot of uh, platforms also providing and pushing support. So a whole lot of startups are coming out of India, trying to reach out to masses with new and new innovation across categories, across sectors, mm -hmm. right? people have got used to that and that will further lead into this what mahesh said is this will further push uh, india into a stronger telemedicine as well yeah uh, it's funny you should mention the food delivery I was, i was speaking to a friend a couple of weeks ago and i mentioned that there's there's way there's like twice as many apps for getting food delivered in india as we have in, in europe like it was it was amazing last time i was there and you know, we become so saturated with technology and different apps, uh, kind of services over the past few years that now there's, there's a conscious effort to, to move away from that. There's a, there's a conscious effort to people, you know, want to use their phones less, use apps less, go back to doing things in person, doing things directly. Uh, and I wonder if that, that attitude as well 
is feeding into this this difference in opinion between uh, between European might, countries between them. Yeah, might be because it's 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 more of a um, what do I say? It's it's more of a cultural um, mm. uh, cultural pattern which is uh, where it's like uh, when when it's a social life, there's a lot of uh, things going around. Whereas you see in the developing world, there's there's too many other activities, so the openness becomes. Whereas in the European or the uh, US side, uh, the cultures are slightly different. So that's that's how that adaptation or going back to the traditional one is what I feel is like. They feel it's the confident is higher on when they go to the traditional ones. Yeah, they feel like um, it's like it's easier because uh, during the starting of this discussion, I told like that. A lot of things when a patient goes to a physician, tries to talk about his ailments, um, they feel confident when they're in front of a physician, they can open up more. Mm -hmm. Rather than being on a virtual environment, uh, they feel they cannot open up more. So that's that's the thing which uh, lands true for this kind of uh, this kind of scenario when it comes to the cultural uh, balance of the regions. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thought when we've all been you know, working from home and stuck on Zoom meetings for the past six months. <laughs> <laughs> what might uh, have also happened here is that uh, because uh, developed markets already were kind of saturated and there was a whole lot of uh, talk about privacy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, GDPR. So people got conscious, right? Uh, people kind of uh, took a step back. Whereas yeah. in developed market, uh, in growing economies, uh, there are still not clear guidelines uh, from the government also. And uh, people themselves are exploring new, new things, right? Yes, they are con uh, they are cautious, but they are not taking a step back as of now. They are still mm -hmm. moving forward fast. They are aware of the things. They got, uh, they've, they've heard those things, but they've not stopped. Whereas in developed markets, they're trying to become a bit slow, right? Mm -hmm. that, that would have also led to this particular difference yeah yeah it's interesting you're both speaking you know simon mahesh is speaking from bangalore as well which i think bangalore is one of the most tech driven cities in the whole of india the kind of development of the the tech scene there has been you know enormous and is uh i think what uh, i mentioned before our local tech players now also taking the lead uh, in the indian market especially are they the ones is a homegrown talent let's say that's behind this, um, you know, telemedicine push. Yeah, a lot of the uh, technology companies driving the initiative here for trans transforming for telemedicine for sure, uh, which is working across. I can call it as it's working pan India, so they're doing a lot of proactive uh, work around it uh, because that's that's where a lot of entrepreneurs are proactively trying to work around the COVID situation where it becomes easier for the patients to connect with uh, physicians so that's that that uh, driving factor is there for sure now i wanted to to address one of the the other interesting parts of the research which i think was more it's almost more directly linked to the, the covid pandemic which was people likely to seek medical advice or consultation before traveling uh, you know at the moment and, and there's very there's very different rates when you look at it between you know countries in the east versus countries in the west um, so I'm curious to get your thoughts on what do you think is the the reasoning behind these different attitudes? Are we seeing, uh, you know, are we seeing these differences in attitude reflected in other parts of the response as well uh, to to the, the COVID pandemic? Um, I'm curious, uh, Max, especially to get your thoughts because you know recently I think it's been all over the news. There's been protests against you know wearing masks and COVID lockdowns in Berlin. Uh, do you think there's this? push pull between a kind of collective movement versus more individualistic perspective and and that's driving these differences in in attitude about whether people actually get themselves checked out medically before before they travel and potentially spread an illness to other people absolutely yeah i i think so um especially when it comes to to a pre-travel uh consultation um people really want to ensure that they are 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 risk free, so to speak, and 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 can can mingle with other other people and, and can travel to another place without being a risk for others. So um, yeah, I think I think that's that's definitely a trend here. 
And then do we see do we see the flip side of that when we look at the countries, you know, developing countries or countries in the east where there's there's more likelihood from people to to seek this advice to seek a, a clean bill of health almost let's say before they go before they travel elsewhere. Maybe say I'm Mahesh. Yeah, I think what, you, what might be happening is that uh, when we compare uh, travel uh, consultation right for developed markets versus uh, developing markets again there are there are slight skews uh, with developing markets uh, showing more uh, inclination towards uh, travel consultation and and the reason could be obvious that uh, people in developing markets they are still kind of uh, getting more to know about uh, the pandemic right mm-hmm. they still want to be sure uh, and that's why if we further see in terms of the findings also the type of consultation which uh, people are interested in uh, developed markets versus developing markets is that uh, in developing markets or emerging economies people are more interested in going for general checkups right for follow up checkups whereas mm-hmm. for uh, for developed markets uh, there is slightly more skew towards uh, getting vaccinations right uh, so th- those would be the key reasons i would say yeah and is there perhaps also a difference between I, mean, I guess the purpose behind the travel as well, you know, is it a question of people in certain countries traveling for leisure, traveling for holidays, as opposed to, let's say, if you're traveling to, you know, see your family or traveling for work purposes, is that also likely to be a driving factor in uh, why there's differing attitudes? Yeah, it might. Uh, see, what happens is uh, uh, there there would be differences when I'm going for a business trip uh, for a work uh, versus when I'm going for a to visit my family right uh, travel mm-hmm. consultation uh, for a business trip uh, might be a bit higher when i'm uh, when i know that uh, i'm i'll go and i'll reach out to my family so i can stay there for a few days right uh, whereas in a business trip it's a to and fro kind of a thing so people would like to go get travel consultation before and also might be interested in post coming back right yeah, and um, may i show your thoughts on this <laughs> it's it's a, it's the same thing what uh, it's like that is like it's becoming kind of a necessity now so uh, before travel or after travel the consultation is becoming little critical because of the risks which is around the environment so people are investing on that uh, but nowadays even the travel has been restricted to which used to be the frequency high, high higher frequency earlier it's not the same now consultations are there for sure and there are some minimal interactions with the physicians also in terms of checkups what, what, what kind of checks they want to do before and after so that just just for the travelers to keep them uh, safe yeah you know there's been some people speaking about especially you know during the coronavirus pandemic the idea of a you know covid passport or you know getting some kind of approval that you are either symptom free or you you're you know, you've had a vaccination or something else before you're allowed to travel uh, i'm curious to get your thoughts you know both from the perspective of in germany and also in india uh, and of course you know you guys looking into the healthcare sector what, what do you think the chances are of something like this actually coming into force do you think soon we are going to have to if we want to travel abroad get a stamp in our passport from someone official to say that we're you know my answer is yes yeah my answer is yes they might be at least if not a stamp this is certification or a clearance from the physician uh, that the that the traveler or the passenger is been either vaccinated or or is on the right medication that he can travel safe so that's that's there sure uh, so that because that's that's the only thing which can be uh, assured that there is a low risk so i i'm sure it would it would come up about that there are uh there is some kind of certification needed uh from either a top hospital or from the government body that uh the traveler has necessary checks uh taken before uh the travel yeah so and i think uh, what what's happening is that uh, some of some of the countries already have that in place like countries in middle east right they are not allowing people uh, till the time they have that uh, they 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 are covid free right or covid negative uh, on top of that with the increasing number of cases again right and economy is uh, being closed for already such a long time uh, again we we are not sure if uh, the complete lockdowns 
would be implemented right hmm. if it doesn't then it becomes pretty important to and we should expect that uh, most of the countries would go ahead they will they will continue with the travels but they will ensure that people uh, carry the covid negative certificates right so again that will feed into the travel consultation kind of part yeah I'm sure Actually, the minister- it's a pretty good question. Sorry to to interrupt because I, I don't think that will be the case in Germany. Hmm. So uh, that's very interesting <laughs> to hear what what my colleagues uh, say about Middle East and India. I don't think that people in Germany are willing to carry such a certificate yeah. around <laughs> or use it <laughs> yeah. when traveling to an- another country or another destination. So um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's that's definitely not going to happen here. So um, <laughs> I think there will be other means of of proving that you're negative in terms of COVID, but having an official passport or like a certificate that proves that you're negative in that regard, um, I, I don't see that to be honest. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, from from the, the kind of Dutch perspective as well, I, I think here you'd have a similar response uh, from people. I don't think they'd be willing to you know, have some kind of declaration that, that they take with them. And I don't know, it was part of the problem, right? Because we live in a globalized world. People want to travel around. And if not every mm-hmm. country is on the same page, then we're going to run into some issues, aren't we, down the line for being able to move freely? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, and staying on, you know, the, the very much ongoing theme for this year, uh, which is uh, which is the COVID pandemic. Um, what do I see, you know, again, based, you know, from, from your geographic perspectives through the research that you've done uh, what do you see as some possible long-term implications uh, of the changes that we've seen during the pandemic so you know th- this increase in people obviously wearing masks uh, social distancing protocols coming into place you know a bigger push on hygiene uh, and what they on i noticed was a reduction in kind of non-essential uh, medical procedures uh, do you think do you see these things continuing into the new year possibly beyond or are we going to see perhaps a slide back uh, in some countries to, to try and get some sense of what normal was like before. I see it continuing till the vaccines or the medications are 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 in place. So uh, that that caution would be there in terms of having all the safeties in place. So it would be, it would probably be till the vaccine which is coming or planned till early twenty twenty one or mid twenty twenty one. So until people get uh, vaccinated or they're on the right medication, uh, it would be there for sure. And do you see like a long term, perhaps, uh, you know, a shift in, in the public conscious maybe towards their attitudes towards, you know, cleanliness, towards hygiene, towards, yeah, social distancing? Is is this something that maybe even once COVID is kind of in the past, are we, are we going to see some of these traits stay on, uh, see people adopt some things more, more long term? Yeah, I would say yes because it's it's become part of life now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so carrying in a mask in the pocket is like it's 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 common now. <laughs> so it will be there for sure. Yeah. It's just become a practice now. It will mm. go on. Yeah. No, I hope staying locked up inside for six months isn't going to continue into uh, <laughs> the future as well. <laughs> yeah, but it has certainly impacted. Uh, some of the hygiene and cleanliness across geographies, right? People are now taking a much more cautious uh, effort in terms of ensuring that uh, there's complete hygiene. And that's not uh, only because of people also. At times, there, there's so much of awareness, all the brands, right? The push is coming from there also. All governments, they, everyone is trying to talk about that, uh, talk about safety, hygiene, right? So it is there to stay. And uh, and Max, what do you think? In because I know there's been some controversy in Germany recently. What do you do? You, do you think people in Europe or in Germany are more likely to to take these things on long term, or are they just waiting until they can get back to get back to how things were before? I think it's sort of a mixed bag. There's there are those who who are strictly adhering to this to this sort of new rule. And, and, and there are the others that don't really believe in, in, in this pandemic, who, who think that's just, like, just a hoax or uh, some, something else to, to um, manipulate the economy and, and everyone else. So, um, but I think it, for the majority, people will, will adhere to that and, and wear masks. And, and, and I think personally, I think it's, it's not a big deal to do so. 
it's not really limiting me at all or um so um i believe it it, it will be um the case also moving forward that people will will are willingly using those uh, masks and then keeping distance to others and okay. and i think you know, just to kind of bring this back to to looking at the future of healthcare, which is where we started in the first place. Uh, you know, as you guys have mentioned, there's lots of examples of how at every stage of the healthcare process and how, you know, in different geographies, the, this technological impact is is increasing. And what do you think are some improvements that are needed for, you know, for healthcare or for, you know, infrastructure in general? And Asayim, I know you mentioned infrastructure before. Uh, what improvements do you think we need to make sure that we can really make the most of this kind of digital health transformation moving forwards? That, that's, uh, in terms of improvement, it's it's mostly around uh, the process optimization and, uh, and adaption towards the digitization, which will be an initiative driven by uh, the healthcare uh, providers or the organizations, because that's, that's something which the faster uh, they get, their uh, stakeholders like physicians and patients onboarded to it, it's easier for them to manage uh, monitoring of the patients. So that's that's what I feel like. It's uh, adaption would be quicker for sure. Uh, that's now the stress around remote monitoring uh, being a high priority. So as fast as they can optimize their processes of managing patients on the technology route would be would be something which will be happening or coming up uh, in the future. So, but I know like most of the hospitals have already started those initiatives. They're asking uh, physicians to learn the technology or adapt to it or try it at least. So that, that kind of things are happening. So that starting 2021, a majority of the users or the stakeholders are part of the transformation process. Yeah. And I think thinking of India in particular, what do we? How about in terms of you know access to technology, access to the internet, uh, and the states? How do you make sure that you know in a country as large as India, let's say you know other large countries that are developing like Nigeria, how do you make sure that everyone gets to you know feel the benefits of this transformation and that people aren't left behind when the rest of society is moving forwards into this next step? So there are a lot of organizations, uh, a small enterprise, a medium enterprise who are coming forward for these kind of initiatives where they can onboard all types of audience, um, cosmopolitan, metropolitan, or even uh, semi-urban or rural kind of populations. So it's like you have all types of applications and all types of technology which can get adjusted to that particular segments. So a lot of the technology companies are putting those kind of efforts so that they can onboard as many as they can, uh, not just the smartphones. Then you have even apps which uh, by a press of a button where it can just call up the necessary doctor directly. A lot of things are happening around that. So there is efforts. Uh, I would say like there are positive efforts on getting people onto the technology, uh, but the number of patients or the population is so large that it would it would not happen quickly it would it would take its own time for transformation for sure because of which there's a lot of government initiatives to onboard people uh, to get on to the necessary applications where government is offering uh, a free consultation or or uh, a kind of a protocol or a guideline which they can go through so that's that's there for sure yeah and uh, further educating masses, right, uh, in terms of the benefits, which Mahesh kind of talked about before, uh, how effective telemedicine can be for uh, uh, not so critical illnesses, right? Uh, so people will get a whole lot of confidence uh, trying to educate them and the government initiatives as well as uh, strengthening the infra. Yeah. And uh, Max, I know you mentioned in... In Europe, we have kind of a, a different perspective on this. I mean, what, what maybe is less so infrastructure, but do you think there needs to be, a, you know, a culture or kind of attitude change uh, that needs to come about uh, in Europe for people to really, you know, embrace these kind of digital transformative technologies? What changes do you think we need to bring about to make sure people have that, have that confidence, have that uh, willingness to try? I, I think you absolutely nailed it. It's it's about the attitude change, right? People need to 
be more open to to this uh, technology um, offering and and also embrace it accordingly because I think that that's that's the future anyways um, regardless of uh, data con protection concerns um, all the old habits that need to be kicked um, in order to, to to yeah to use the new ones the new new technology but um, I think because we have everything in place in terms of technology we have um, 5g um, um, here and, and and everything is is there available so um, I think it's just a, it's, it's just a question of time mm. that um, people will be using and utilizing telemedicine more no so I, I look forward to you know the digital future I think I'm willing to give it a try <laughs> at least want to avoid that round trip as I mean um, Thank you so much, uh, Max Mahesh and Siam, for taking the time to join me today. And it has been a really interesting discussion and something that's going to be yeah, really interesting to keep an eye on moving forwards, too, over the next couple of years. And as we you know, move out of the, hopefully, fingers crossed, move out of the, the pandemic as well. So yeah. thank you all for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners uh, for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, so I do hope you've enjoyed it. I do hope you've learned something new. And hopefully it's set some thoughts going in your mind as well. Uh, just to let you know, we are now available as well as on Spotify, on iTunes, on TuneIn, on Deezer, Amazon Music, and more platforms besides. Make sure you do check out Max's article on his research on Research World. And you can, of course, see more of Boardless Access's research on their website. Thank you once again for taking the time to listen to us. Uh, please do stay safe, stay curious, and I do hope to see you again next time. <music>